man, I, I've gotten bragged. <laughs> and I know that um, I feel like I'm pregnant after last night. Yeah. Um, and I just want to, who here knows, who's, who here has heard me speak before? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll, I will give you a little background, um, but um, I just want to, I think maybe I'm like a bridge because, um, you know, so many people that we've seen have been doing this for 40, 50 years. You know, and um, Mike and I haven't been doing that that long, doing this that long. And so I'm hoping what maybe my life will look like is maybe um, give some stepping stones for the, for maybe the earlier parts that will be very practical. Um, and because I was touched in a meeting very similar to this, and, and I'll get into that, but... Um, God is just um, so, so unique and so, so beautiful. And, and he's displayed through every one of us together as a body. He's not displayed in any one person wholly or completely. We only look like God together. Without one another... We are a distortion of God. And we have to understand that. And we have to look and look for God in people. And we will find him. If we look for God, we will find him. If we look for division, we will find division. If we look for our differences, they are so easy to see. But if we look for God, we're going to get this holistic picture of who he is. And this is, I believe, this is the, a transition that the church is stepping into right now, where um, this transition has to take place. Because Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And, and that is true, that it is going to happen, and that, is, that, that has to happen. And that means that we all have to attain to the unity of the faith. It's not going to be just people who are up on the stage. We have to look like Christ together as the church. You know the first time... Um, that the that the word church was mentioned. Does anybody know? It was the first time that the word church was mentioned was in the book of Matthew, Matthew 16, which we heard a lot about these last couple of days. And do you know who it was spoken by? Jesus. Okay, this is really, really super important because it is really important that we understand what Jesus said was the church, not what, we, what we've made it into, but what Jesus said was the church. And the word that he used is only used twice in the New Testament, in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18. And that word that Jesus used for us which is so important, so important, it's the word ecclesia. And that word was not, a, and a lot of you probably know this, but I just want to form a foundation a little bit, is that word was not a religious word at all, at all. It was a political, governmental word. And, and what that word meant to Jesus and what he was trying to communicate to who we are corporately is that he said, I'm going to build my church, my ecclesia, on this, on this rock, actually a pebble. That word was a stone, a pebble. Jesus is the rock of our foundation. But the, Peter, he was a pebble. He was a, 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 a bedrock. Right. He was a bedrock. And... Um, 
And when Jesus said church, that word meant a group of people that were summoned. That's me and you. All of us. All of us. We are not complete without each other. We are just not. We, 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 we have to understand this. We are not complete. And we are coming into a place where we have to have a united voice. We have to be the united ecclesia. And this, this word meant a governing authority. A legislative authority. That's the word. That, that is who we are. That is the word church. It is not a place where you come together on Sunday. We gather. That's an assembly. We gather together. But when, when it breaks my heart when people talk ugly about the church because, you know, my husband loves me a lot. I, and it cracked me up. Um, Brother Hogan, the way he talked about his wife and how fierce he was. My husband loves me like that. And Jesus loves his bride like that. You know, it doesn't matter our flaws. We are still fiercely protected, fiercely adored, fiercely loved by God. So we need to really be careful because I think sometimes... Um, uh, our, our words are important. And sometimes we put wrong words on things and it creates a movement. And so if we're going to talk about the things that we don't like, we need to talk about the spirits. We need to talk about the spiritual forces. We need to talk about the spirit of religion or the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But that is not the church. The church is the beloved wife of Jesus. We are going to, we're in process, we're, we're going to be incredible. That, that's, our, that's our goal, and it will happen. It, it, I mean, it's not a, it, it's not a maybe, it's, it's going to happen. We're just going to be incredibly beautiful, but we have to love each other first. All throughout the word. It talks about loving, loving, right? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But what, what's real interesting, which we forget because we're so, so many times we're biting each other, but um, that it says, especially to the household of faith. Love. As, why? Because we have to love each other before we can love the world. If we don't, it's not true love. The Bible says you can't curse God or you can't curse your brother and say you love God. It, no matter what you think or no matter how true we think or right we think we are, it is impossible. We cannot continue talking, saying bad things about each other and say that we love God. It's just, it's impossible. And so I just want to kind of set things straight because I really, I am not up here alone. Neither was anyone else. But I'm with you. And we need to really be on the same page because when we're in unity, we are a governing authority. And if we're talking about New York or we're talking about anywhere else around the world, we have to be that. And Jesus called us to be that. And what that means is that, and, and he explains it, he says, I am going to give you the keys. Why did he say, I'm going to give you the keys? Because he hadn't gone and gotten them yet, right? When he was saying this in Matthew, he hadn't gone and gotten them yet. But he said, this is what's going to happen. I am going to go get the keys. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you those keys. Do you know what the keys are? They're the keys to what? The kingdom. They're not, like, the world, the earth, is still under demonic influence. A lot of people don't think that we got the keys back to the earth. That's not what happened. We got the keys of the kingdom. Uh, swing wide, you ancient gates. Oh, you everlasting door. Why? The king of glory is coming in. Who is this king of glory? He's the Lord, strong and mighty in battle. And so... 
So those are the keys that we got. And what he said, it, and, and um, Brother Hogan was, you know, spot on, is um, death has, I mean, it, it doesn't have anything. It doesn't have any, any power um, when the kingdom comes in. And our job is to open the door, to use the, the, the keys to open the door so that the kingdom can come. We are supposed to forbid, the word is forbid, anything that is not found in heaven, when we approach it, Together, as the church, as the governing body, this works best when we are united together. We have the most power. Now, it can happen individually, but if you're talking about global transformation, if you're talking about city transformation, if you're talking about a nation being birthed in a day, you are talking about needing the church. The church, and this is what I'm saying, this is, I hope this is making sense, but this is this threshold that we're, where we are entering this season um, where uh, we are going to transform nations yeah. united as the bride of Christ. And you know, it, it, an interesting side note um, that I've been fast. I read the Song of Solomon almost every day. I just feel like it really centers me because I, I love it. And, and one of the reasons is because like it, it shows like all, all different aspects of our walk with God and how delighted Jesus is with us as soon as we turn to him. Like as soon as we realize that he's in us and we're in him. Yeah. He's like, oh my goodness, yeah, you may be dark, but you are so lovely to me. <laughs> you know, you, you may not have had time to do your hair, but oh my goodness, you are absolutely my delight. But over and over again, Jesus himself in the Song of Solomon says, you are my equal. Yeah. It's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he says it over and over, my equal, my bride my equal, my bride. And um, I, I know you're like this too, but I have such a desire to be prepared for m my husband, my bridegroom, Jesus. I, I, you know, I just, I want to be adorned. I want to be, I want to be ready. He's so worthy for me to be who God betrothed to his son. You know, it's not just anybody. <laughs> I remember when, you know, my, my husband came on the scene and my dad was like, you know, I have to meet this man <laughs> because just not anybody is going to marry my daughter, you know, and, um, and so when we're talking about the beautiful body, I want to, um, I want to just take you to 1 Corinthians. And I have so much to share with you that I'm probably not going to be able to, you know, to get through in today's session and, and um, tomorrow's session. Um, but it's all about love. I mean, and, and I'm not just saying that because... You know, people say, I have a compassion ministry. Um, I'm not just saying that because that's, you know, something that the Lord called me to do or whatever. The bottom line is that loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself sums up the whole commandment. And we are a gifts ministry. We've seen the dead raised. We've seen the blind eyes opened. We've seen cerebral palsy completely healed. Um, documented MRIs. You know, like, we, we've seen a lot of miracles. The government sends babies that the doctors say will never walk to us now because we have such a record of children walking who have never walked. So, I believe in that. And I believe that 
Jesus has to be represented well and that we we have to move in signs and wonders you know like we need to represent Jesus well but love love is it Amen. love is it and we pursue we we desire earnestly the spiritual gifts but we pursue love Everything that, and the spiritual gifts and all of this stuff comes with love. Yeah. It does. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will be added unto you. And so I just kind of want to uh, go over some scriptures just to kind of set precedent. And I know there's scriptures that everybody knows, and but I would just... Um, suggest. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. I know. Don't you love it? Aren't you thankful? I know. Me too. I'm so thankful for the Passion Translation. It's my, my, my absolute favorite. Um, but I'm going to read to you, and I really believe in the public reading of the Word, because I think, you know, um, I'm going to try to do my best to be the microphone and let God be the voice. But the word of God is, I mean, it just does does things that I can't do. You know, like it just does. So it's going to do the job <laughs> that God wants to do um, just by us reading or listening. And um, But I just want to point some things out. So I'm going to start in um, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. And you can read along, um, but I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. So if you want to just sit back and listen, and try to listen like you're hearing it for the first time. It is the same Holy Spirit who, con who continues to distribute many variety of gifts. The Lord, Yahweh, is one, and He is the one. He is the one who apportions to believers different varieties of ministries. The same God, the same God, we don't decide what gifts and what ministries we get. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they're the ones that, dis that decide. The same God distributes different kinds of miracles that accomplish different results through each believer's gift and ministry as he energizes and activates them. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just himself, but all. For example, I love this, for example, the Spirit gives to one the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, the Spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation knowledge. Listen now. We are a body. We're a body. And to another, the same Spirit gives the gift of faith. And to a different person, another, the same Spirit gives the gifts of healing and to another the power of work uh, the power to work miracles and to another the gift of prophecy and to another the gift to discern what the spirit is speaking and to another the gift of speaking in different kinds of tongues and to another the gift of the interpretations of tongues now remember it is the same holy spirit who distributes activates and operates these gifts as he chooses for every believer. One of the reasons I want to say this is because I, I was birthed into a, a healing movement. You know, Randy Clark was the, you know, the, the one that, that um, touched Mike and I, and, and um, I believe it was my conversion. I believe it was not just a, a baptism. I believe that I was born again. And, um, and uh, even though I had said the prayer of salvation as a child and I was raised in a Christian home, um, I believe that was my, I was born again. I was changed. I was, yeah, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I was, 
I was taken with Jesus and I would have, I, I fell in love with him so much so that him asking us to go to China was not a big deal. Because like if Mike was in the military and he was being shipped off somewhere and he said, come with me, there's absolutely no question that I would, I would go where my husband is and it would be maybe hard at times, but a delight, a joy to be with my husband. That's how it was when Jesus called us. It was not, it was not hard. It was, um, it was wonderful and um, beautiful and exciting and fulfilling. And there were hard components to it, just like there is in everything. Um, but it's him. It's the same spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these different gifts as he chooses for each believer. So don't feel bad. Like, it, I just don't want anybody to feel guilty or feel condemned or feel bad because you're not doing the things that are part of these lists because your job is to desire them. Your job is to desire them so that we can edify the church, so that we can lift, and these are not my words, this is the word of God, so that we can, we can bring people into the kingdom and so we can edify the body. Okay, so just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by the same Spirit, we are all immersed and mingled into one body. I couldn't get away from you if I wanted to. And to say that I could just drop you or leave you behind is not accurate. You and I are immersed the same way that I'm one with Christ. If you believe that you're one with Christ, you have to believe you're one with one another. We are immersed and mingled yes. together. Yes. And we were never meant, a uh, side note, uh, a real short side note. Um, the word orphan in Hebrew means to be alone. We were never meant to be alone, ever. We were never meant to be alone. Now listen to this. Uh, track with me just for a minute. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam was created, Adam and Eve were created together, right, as one, and then they were separated. But they were, they were created, both male and female, in the image of God. And... Um, God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit stood back after they created each thing during the six days, and they said, ah, oh, this, is, this is good. We did good. And, you know, and after they got done creating everything, they stood back and they said, this is very good. This is very good. And um, then in chapter 2, we know that God began bringing all of, you know, all of creation to Adam to name all the creatures and everything. But God found that there was no suitable companion for Adam. Now, imagine this. Those of us that think that all we need is God. Adam had God in a perfect garden before sin. And God looked at him before sin. This isn't something that the devil did. Before sin, he looked at everything he created and then he saw Adam and he said, it's not good for a man to be alone. Adam had God. Every night, in the cool of the night, God would come down and they would talk. They were intimate with each other. And God himself was not enough. Right? Is that right? Yeah. 
God wasn't, he had God. He had God every day without sin in a perfect environment. And God called him alone. We were not meant to be alone. We were not meant to just be somewhere secluded with God. We are complete as a family. I don't know why he did it that way. I don't, but I know that he did it. And I know that it's really, really super important as we're talking about the church that we are unified. That we are unified. Um, so let's just keep reading. Okay. Mingled into one single body. And no matter our status, whether we're Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, he never meant for us to be separated by anything, by gender, by by nationality, by, by, sta and by nothing. We are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. In fact, the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. So if the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it is forgetting that it is still vital it is still, now this is talking about the gifts. This is talking about how we were created. It's forgetting that it is still a vital member of the body. And if an ear were to say, since I'm not the eye, I'm really not a part of the body. It is forgetting that it is still an important, important part of the body. Think of it this way. If the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sounds? If the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But listen, verse 18. But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. A diversity is required. For if the body consisted of one single part, there would not be a body at all. Wow. So now we see that there are many differing parts and functions, but one body. Now, it would be wrong for the eye to say to the hand, I don't need you. It's wrong. It's wrong for an eye to say to a hand, I don't, I don't have any need of you. I can do this all by myself. And equally wrong if the head says to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts. Now this is the wisdom of God, guys. This is the, this is the beautiful fathering wisdom of God who cherishes each child and their unique individuality no matter what, no matter what. So he says, the body parts we think are less honorable, we treat with greater respect. And the body parts in the natural that we cover in public, we're giving them more priority and we're clothing them. We're giving them more attention. But some of our body parts don't require as much attention. Instead, God has mingled the body parts together, giving greater honor to the lesser members who lacked it. He has done this intentionally. Listen to this. He has done this intentionally so that every member would look after others with mutual concern and so that there would be no division in the body. 
in that way, whatever happens to me happens to you, and whatever happens to you happens to me. In that way, whatever happens to one member happens to us all. And if one suffers, everyone suffers. And if one is honored, everyone rejoices. <laughs> you are a body of who? The anointed one. This is the pebble. This is the rock, the stone that Jesus said, Peter answered Jesus when Jesus says, who do you say I am? And he said, the Aramaic translation is he said, you are the anointed one, the very son of the living God. Verse 27, you are the body of the anointed one. And each of you is unique and vital. You know, God is so serious about this that, that he says in the word, it says, if you call your brother good for nothing, it's serious. Wow. It doesn't matter what you think. And it doesn't matter how true that that person may look in your eyes to be good for nothing. That person was created in the image of God and is a vital a vital member of a healthy functioning body. I, we have many children with disabilities who, who are not healthy. And it's not right. It's, it makes the body have to work differently. And it puts stress on the body. And it's not the way that it was meant to be. You are the body of the anointed one, and each one of you is unique and vital, a vital part of it. And God has placed in the church the following. Okay, this is a list. First, second, third, then. This is this part. Now we see the, the fivefold ministry in Ephesians as well, and they're not ordered like this because... The purpose of Ephesians and the purpose of 1 Corinthians are different. This is talking about the church and the flow of the kingdom to earth. And there is, there is a correct avenue. Even Jesus has a head. The Bible says God is, is Jesus' head. There is, there is a flow, there is an order, and this is part of it. But listen, it's first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then those with the gift of miracles, gifts of divine healing, gifts of revelation knowledge, gifts of leadership, and gifts of different kinds of tongues. Verse 29, not everyone is an apostle or a prophet or a teacher. But remember that the lesser in the body has greater honor according to God. See, it's, it's all this submitting ourselves one to another. It's even though I have all of this authority and all of this, this, this um, divine flow that, that, that has a head, the head still submits. Brother and sister still submit, even though I'm a wife and I submit to my husband. And, but it is, it is because I know who I am that it works beautifully. And by not, you know, it, actually in the original language, it's not the word submit. It is tenderly devoted. It's so much more relational. God is so much more relational than some of the translates suggest. And do you know, as a wife, part of what I'm doing right now, like, isn't like, um, you know, we are changing the nation and we are doing that and we are working with governments and we, we are doing that. But, but part of the thing that I am like going after is being a godly wife, and everything that I do for my husband these days has the check. And this check is, 
I'm supposed to be tenderly devoted to my husband as I am to Jesus. I am tenderly devoted to Jesus. He could have anything, anytime. I, I mean, he just moves and my heart skips a beat. And I would do anything, right? You're the same way, right? I mean, Jesus. Jesus. It's Jesus. And I am to be, have that same devotion to my husband as I do to Jesus. Why? Because it creates an environment that as a body, as one, the kingdom can come appropriately to the earth so that we are ready for the second coming. There are these avenues that there, there, all of these, these covenant relationships that talks, that the word talks about, husbands and wives, children, parent, employee, employer, all of those covenant relationships are super, super important. In context of the ecclesia that was called to be the governing authority. We have to be in right relationship with each other, especially to the body of Christ, right? Especially to the brethren, especially to my brothers and sisters first. So many times we focus on, especially missionaries, you know, focus on the world, the world, the world. And, and a lot of missionaries, sometimes I come across missionaries, that they can't get along in the church and so they move to a different country so that they can be a leader. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. It shouldn't be that way. We should be a blessing to our fellowship wherever God has planted us. We should be undergirding our leadership in the church. We should be encouraging and lifting people up. And then if God chooses to send us to a nation, we stay in relationship with our brothers and sisters back home and we keep honoring. We don't come home and dump on you about how bad you are and how great we are <laughs> because we're feeding the poor or because we've given everything that we have away. It's, that's not, that's just not, the kingdom. And those things are amazing. And I believe in all of them. And I've given my life away. And everything that I own. And my family. And my children. I'm live. You know, I'm not just talking about this. Like, I've done all of that. And I'm still saying, what I found, this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. Let's just keep reading just for a minute as I'm almost done. <laughs> Not everyone is an, an apostle or a prophet or a teacher. Not everyone performs miracles or have gifts of healing or speaks in tongues or interprets. But you should all constantly boil over with passion and seeking the higher gifts. And now I will show you a superior way to live that is beyond comparison. If I were to speak, now this, we all know 1 Corinthians 13. And what this is talking about, though, is it's a reflection of the church and her gifts that were distributed by the Spirit. Because then it, it goes back over them. It talks about languages, heavenly tongues. It talks about prophecy. It talks about gifts of faith, it, right? It talks about all that. So it says, if I were to speak with the eloquence and the earth's many languages and heavenly tongues of angels, and yet I did not express myself with love, my words would be reduced to ho the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. Now the, the gift of many languages is a heavenly gift. It's amazing. 
It's beautiful. It's powerful. But if we don't have a heart of love, it's just noise. It's not powerful. It's not beautiful. Actually, it, it causes stumbling blocks. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy, which I love, I flow in the prophetic, I, it's, it's one of my favorites. But if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, And if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains or raise the dead, I believe in raising the dead. I've raised the dead. I had a baby in my arm who God brought back to life. I believe it. And it's what I want more than anything. As a mother, you can imagine, I've held 29 dead babies in my arms. It is awful. It's awful awful. It's not right. It's unjust. But I can do that. I can have the faith to raise the dead and still not love. It's possible because it's in here. And God is warning us about that. Right? Am I right? Yeah. And so we just have to be really careful is what I'm saying. We have to be really careful. If I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move a mountain, but I've never learned to love, then I'm nothing. Remember Bob Jones? Remember how God sent him back to earth and he said, learn to love. And then he was taken home to be with God on Valentine's Day. The greatest prophet. <laughs> we all need to learn this. No matter what our great gifting is, we all need to learn. We all need to grow in this. And if I, now this is for, for us missionaries. If I were to be so generous as to give everything I had away, everything I own to feed the poor, that in itself, me giving away every, my cars and my house and my jewelry and all that we had, that doesn't, that in itself is not the definition of love. Now it is lo it 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 can be a works of of faith without works is dead. It can be that, but not necessarily. We can't bank on that if our heart isn't pure. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not because none of us, our love is perfect. Not yet. We are perfecting our love. But if that's not a desire, and if God and other people don't have a place to speak into our heart and to show us the places that we're not lovely, something's wrong. So if I were to be so generous as to give everything I had away, Everything I own to feed the poor. And listen to this. This one is the one that gets me. And even turned my body over to be a martyr. Burned. You know, that, that means to me, and I know you guys know this, but that means to me that there have been martyrs that didn't have love. Imagine that. Imagine, what does the word say? Many will stand at heaven's gates. And the Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they'll say, what do you mean? I did this in your name. Right? I prophesied. I healed the sick in your name. What do you mean? I never knew you. This is possible. And and it's so, see, the, the tragedy is that this beautiful, wise way of God is so simple that even a child, even a child with a severe disability can function in love. 
But we've turned it into something as a church where we elevate gifts over love. And we need the gifts. No, nobody would believe me without the gifts. You know, they would just think I was a human, humanitarian organization. I need the power. I need to demonstrate the power. But love, you can get into heaven sick. Can you not? If you, are, if you die from sickness and you have committed your life to Christ, you can go to heaven. You can go to heaven needing deliverance. I know beautiful Christian brothers and sisters. I had to go through deliverance. I think everybody needs to go through some form of, you know, get rid of stuff and, you know, all of that. But you cannot go to heaven without being adopted. You cannot. It's, love is the most important thing. And so if we're going to practice something, if we're going to pursue something, pursue love. Let, let, the, let us and the other speakers and the testimonies and stir up a desire for spiritual gifts and ask God for them and for the edification, the, the lifting up, the drawing of the Holy Spirit so people's eyes can be opened. Desire them for good, to help people, to love people, the church and the world. But pursue love. And everybody can do that. Nobody should go away feeling inadequate or condemned. Everybody should go away feeling like, oh my goodness, I can actually do that. Like, I can do this. And it's powerful. I am just a little woman who didn't know anything about anything. And just love. I'm seeing a nation, a closed nation changed. I'm seeing laws changed because of my little prayers. Our, our little ecclesia, our little, you know, joint group, just believing in a something's un, unjust. I don't curse my government, the Chinese government. They're my authority. They're my authority. I don't, I bless them and I go to God and I, and I know who I am and I know I have authority to change laws. I am the governing authority with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to say so. And, and if it doesn't happen right away, we pray until it changes. And we've seen laws changed through prayer and fasting and intercession and worship and dance. I'm an extravagant dancer. <laughs> and it's just one of the easiest ways to transform a nation, I think. And my body is healthy right now. And I can do that. And I can give everything that I have away because I don't have anything else. I only have my heart that is an acceptable offering to the Lord. Just so that we would not get this messed up, it gives us a definition of love. Okay, so these are the things that we practice with each other. We practice. We practice with our covenant relationships, but we also practice with people that we, we don't have a close relationship, the ones that are different from us, but still members of the body of Christ. We still practice these things. Because who, who are we that we would know into a man's heart? Only God knows that. Yeah. Only God. I remember one time Mike and I were traveling to Minnesota because at 28 years old, Mike's brother was killed in a car accident and instantly killed. And we got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning and found out that his brother had been killed, left a wife behind and just, I mean, just doesn't feel good. You know, this was bef before 
we had our, our touch from the Lord. And so we were just devastated. And I remember getting into a taxi. And this taxi driver was so mean. Like, just really mean. You know, like, and he, but you know what? He didn't know what had just happened. He didn't understand that. And, and so he was treating us differently than after he found out what happened. And there's so many things that we don't know why people are mean, why people act ugly. I, I acted so ugly, for so, and I didn't even know why I was acting ugly, you know? And so, but God knows, and he's so smart. He just says, let me take care of that. You love. There's not a, like a third part of the commandment. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Jesus, the story of the Good Samaritan. This was, I'll get into a whole other theological discussion on this. But the bottom line is the question was about eternal life. These are important, important questions because we've been telling people, just believe in Christ. Believe in Christ and you'll be saved. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth and we'll be saved. Well, the problem is, is that a lot of times we are not preaching the cross. And so there's not repentance. And the reason that Jesus had to come to the earth and die was for sin. The sin issue has to be dealt with. And this thing about, about eternal life, the, you know, the, the, the lawyer tested Jesus. I love Heidi says, that's so stupid to test Jesus. How stupid is that? That's so stupid. It's stupid to test Jesus. But the lawyer didn't realize what he was doing. And so he's testing Jesus. He said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, well, what Jesus said, what does the scripture say? And the lawyer answered correctly, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yes, do that, and you'll inherit eternal life. And then comes the qualifier, because heaven forbid that we extend sacrificial love to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And he said, tell me exactly who my neighbor is. Why did he say that? So that he didn't have to love anybody else besides the, that, that group. So he could leave people out of the love equation. And so Jesus tells this story about the man laying on the side of the road that was beaten and robbed. And the priest went by. And the worshiper went by. The people of God went by. And it was the Samaritan who saw and felt compassion and stopped. And gave his money and his time. Took him to the hospital. Took him to the inn. Took care of him himself. Still had things to do, and he didn't forget that he had other obligations, and he had to go, so he paid somebody, right, to take care of the man. And he says, whatever, whatever else he spends, put it on my tab, I'm coming back. And the Bible says he was the neighbor, the one who extended mercy. These are, these are Im, Im, real important, and they're super simple, super, super important. So, Father wanted us to really, really be sure that we understood what love was. Love is large and incredibly patient. See, we can practice this. We can practice this. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. Love refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. 
Love does not brag about one's own achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love doesn't traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as a defeat because it never gives up. It never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift. I love this part. It, be, it extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which is talks about later, if you're going to desire a gift, desire prophecy, right? But love, and you know, so many of us want these gifts. And I want the gifts. I want them. And I want prophecy because I know how powerful it is. But love extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which will actually eventually fade away. It's more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge have been forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial. But when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters. For I saw things like a child and I reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured and I set aside my childish ways. For now, it doesn't matter who we are or how much we're doing in the world. We see in part, compared to what God knows, we, it's funny when we think that we know stuff. Compared to his knowledge, we see in part, only God sees all. So that's why he told us, just focus on these two things. It'll take care of every single thing in the Old Testament. All the laws, all the prophets, all the stuff you don't understand, all the stuff that doesn't make sense. You say, I wish I had a translation for this. Could somebody please tell me what the book of Ezekiel means? Or, you know, um, But we see in part... We prophesy in part. For now we see a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror. But one day we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now. But one day I will understand everything. Just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are three things that remain. Your faith, your hope, and your love. But if you had to just hold on to one thing, choose love. Love will carry you through. Love will. Yes, amen. Thank you, Paul. So above all else, this is just what I, I want just to stick. Above anything else that you've heard, that I would teach or that anybody else would teach for all times, above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. Amen. Not beautiful? It's beautiful. And this is the God that the world needs. When the world starts seeing this beautiful God, they are going to run to him. They're going to run and to our assemblies, they're going to want prayer. They're going to want, because every, I mean, look at our beautiful brother up here. Didn't you just want to be with him? I mean, he's just like this father 
This, the somebody that you want to be around. You know, like just, oh, it's awesome. People want to be around the Father. It's just wonderful to be around a, a, a somebody who's really good at being a father or a mother. I have many sons, and I'm, I'm just going to take probably just a, a few more minutes. It's probably if I get into the next subject, it would take another hour. But I have, um, I'll just tell you just a tiny bio of me. I am 47 years old. And um, I have nine children, so I have two biological sons and two adopted beauties and five foster children. I have a lot of foster children. I have a lot of children that live in our children's home. But these are mine, you know, like that I personally, my husband and I have raised personally. And um, for one reason or another, they weren't allowed by the government to be adopted, but they don't know that. They just think that, you know, they just know that we, you know, they're ours. My oldest son, who I, I mean, I, I absolutely adore him. His name is Logan. And um, he was always very different from me and Mike. Like, the, like um, you know, a lot of times we think, where did this child come from? <laughs> you know, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was one of those children that, needed special attention. Um, it, it, uh, he was and is uh, just, uh, just a wonderful person. Uh, but he was very different than Mike and I. Like he, um, he always had a fascination with war and um, fighting. And, you know, Mike and I were like, I mean, we're totally like, Here's my other cheek kind of people, you know, like, and, and here's a son from the time he was 12 or 13 who knew that he knew that he wanted to be a Marine. And we thought, you know, that's just something that boys say because they want to pick the hardest, you know, the hardest thing and it's a fantasy and, you know, all of that. No, not, not this child. I mean, this, this desire to be in martial arts, to, to be a boxer, to be, you know, to be on the front lines just increased. And so different from Mike and I, you know, in, in the natural sense, so, so different. And of course, I mean, if we were to choose, he would be at Hidden Treasure's home in China holding babies, you know. He, said, he would say to us when he was younger, Mom, this place is just peace, love, and babies. Peace, love, and babies. That's all you have is peace, love, and babies. It's like drives me crazy. <laughs> peace, love, and babies. <laughs> we were like, I know, isn't it great? No, not to him. It was, that wasn't his idea of fun. <laughs> And so when it came time for him to graduate, he graduated and he decided to join the United States Marine Corps. And um, everybody in Christian circles, my mothers and fathers, I mean, they were all concerned because the Marines have a, a reputation for like mental warfare, you know, like you, they do. They have to break you down and build you back up again. And there's, a, you know, psychological stuff and PTSD and all that stuff. And so, you know, everybody's like, oh, how are you doing? And um, so what Mike and I did, we just got with God. And we, you know, just said, what, what is this? And um, we waited until we heard and got confirmation. But the Lord said, this is me. This is my calling on your son. This is my calling. And I won't get into the whole thing, but as soon as we heard from God, I was fine. I was absolutely fine. And he chose, like my husband's a, um, is a former member of the military, our father's grandfather, so we come from that, that lineage. And um, so, you know, Mike was saying, okay, well, what, what do you want to, what do you want to go into? What do you want to do in the military? What's your PO, you know, what do you want to do? And um, he said, I just, I want to start at the bottom. 
mom and dad, I want to start, because I want to understand what it's like for everybody. So if that way, if, if I do continue, like I'll, I'll know. And we're like, okay, but you know, like you could go to college and you could, you know, like, yeah. Because all I, I mean, I had a vision of him with a big machine gun and, you know, shooting people, which I, you know, it's hard for me to think about, about that. And, um, but we said, pray about it. And so he did. And, um, felt very strongly like he was to go into infantry. So he's in the Middle East right now on secret missions. We don't know where he is. I heard from him. Actually, he sent me a message this morning saying that he, he really feels like the word is that, that their um, troop will be coming home soon, that, that their mission has been kind of wrapped up. God knows stuff is what I'm saying. And what my personal feelings are don't matter. My personal opinions about stuff don't matter. All that matters is God's voice. God's voice. And he's got people in all kinds of different things that are unlikely, that, that are, are different. And, um, but he knows what he's doing. And we're now sending people to the Middle East, missionaries, we're sending to the, to the Middle East. And um, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I did it in the natural first. Like, you know, and your son is on the front lines and he does carry a machine gun. And I'm sure he, he's had to do things that I don't want to hear about. But I trust God. I trust God with my life. I trust God with my children. I trust God with my husband. And and um, I don't know why I got off on, on that little topic. That's for somebody. There you go. Um, I think my point is, is that sometimes we don't understand our brothers and sisters. But that's okay. As long as we love them. That's okay as long as we love them. And that, that's our mandate. So that's kind of the... Um, foundation that I wanted to lay before I kind of get into um, China and uh, and what you know what God's called us to do there. Um, so I'll stop now because it's five fifteen. Thank you.